let's get to it. I got a story for you, and uh, I'm not going to give it away right away, but you've, if you grew up in church, you've probably heard this story before. I'm just going to tell it. I'm not going to read it because it's uh, quite a few chapters, and so uh, we're going to call it The Man Who Ran From God. So, there was this dude, and God showed up and said to him that he wanted him to go to a certain city. Now, this certain city, this man knew, was not a very good city. In fact, I would say it was a city of scoundrels, all of them. They were very wicked. They did terrible things. In fact, to this man's own country and you know, probably his family and friends, they had done atrocities, like terrible, terrible things. These people were vile. And God said to go to them and to tell them that they're going to get destroyed, that God is going to destroy them. Well, the man who happened to be a prophet. You already know this, who this is, don't you? <laughs> said, uh, I don't think so. Now, I don't think he actually said that to God, but in his actions, he did. And so the prophet, whose name was Jonah, it says went down. And you'll notice, especially in that first chapter, he went down a whole bunch of times. There's significance to that, but we don't have time for that today. <laughs> um, but the significance ultimately is that he is, when you're running away from God and what he has for you, um, it's you're descending. Like it's, it's like in a bad way, right? Where you would ascend, <laughs> you would go up. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> Jonah decides there's no way because these are terrible people. Hey guys, you guys have time to talk in about... Uh, 25 minutes. How's that? Deal? Awesome. Jonah decides there's no way he's going to this place called Nineveh. These people are terrible. And Jonah knows a lot about God. He's, he's a prophet. He knows God's character. He's, uh, he's a little worried that, uh, that God might do something he really, really would not like. And then probably regret actually following God's call. So he goes and finds a ship. And uh, he's in Joppa, it says. And he, he pays for, uh, for passage and uh, goes down into the, the boat, falls asleep. Now, there's a whole message in that. <laughs> How when you run from God, sometimes you can get a, a, a false sense of peace. So you think you're doing the right thing. Uh, I don't know if that's what Jonah had, but for him to fall asleep, running from God, he must have felt safe. <laughs> that he was, ah, God will never find me, right? It's kind of funny looking back at it now and going like, really? But we do that sometimes, right? We think we kind of hide from God. Anyway, storm comes up. Jonah's still sleeping. Now that is some, that's in a lot of peace <laughs> to be able to be sleeping in a storm. They wake him up and tell him, like, this is the worst storm like we've ever been in. And I can imagine Jonah just having this feeling of dread. Uh-oh. Maybe I'm not safe from God. <laughs> just kind of a weird statement, right? So Jonah goes up, sees the storm. He knows it's him. These sailors have been praying to all their gods and doing all the stuff that they could and Throwing, off, throwing cargo over because the ship's going to go down. This is a terrible storm. And Jonah says, throw me overboard. <laughs> Can you imagine if you're one of the sailors and some dude that you just hired and gave you money for passage is telling you to throw him overboard in the middle of the sea in a horrible storm. Like that's death. Like there's no coming back from that. Like you didn't ask for a life raft. And <laughs> right? They're, they're kind of like, I don't think so. So at, at first they were totally, no way, we're not going to throw you overboard. This is crazy. But then the storm got worse and worse. And finally, there was no other option. And they threw Jonah overboard. 
Now just imagine you're these sailors. Like, what's going on? You just threw somebody over into the storm to their death. And as you watch, expecting this guy just to drown and then going like, yeah, we'll join you in a couple minutes because this boat isn't going isn't gonna to stay afloat in this storm. They see this giant creature, big, huge, fish-like creature, and it swallows Jonah whole. <laughs> Can you imagine? Like, this is like, what? Like, these guys are probably just in shock. And then the storm subsides. Sailors aren't mentioned again in the story. But uh, I wonder what happened to those guys. That was quite the experience. Because they didn't, they didn't see the end. That's where the story ended for them. And so, you know, when they're telling their grandkids, yeah, this, this crazy dude, we threw him overboard in the worst storm ever. <laughs> right? And then a big, huge fish ate him. It was this big. <laughs> it was really big. Swallowed him whole. But that's where the story ends for the sailors. Story didn't end for Jonah there. This must have been a really big fish because he was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. It must have been awful. Like, I don't know how that is even possible. Obviously, God had a hand in it. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, it ain't happening. <sighs> And then Jonah's praying, and and at the end of the prayer, um, God makes the the fish vomit him, it says, which is interesting language. He vomited him onto dry land. Out he goes. And so, this reluctant preacher heads to Nineveh and does what God told him to do, preaches a sermon. And I think in the Hebrew, it's only like five words. (laughs) It's the shortest sermon ever. Because he's, I I think he still does not want to do this. But he's just like, oh, it's probably better than being in the belly of that fish. So (laughs) I guess I'll do it. And so he he preaches doom. He tells that Nineveh is going to be destroyed in 40 days. In 40 days, God will destroy the city. It goes around. Now I'm sure word got back to the king and the king of Nineveh, uh, who would have been a horribly wicked man. Um, Some of the things that, this is, uh, Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria, which was the dominant world power at the time, and the the terrible things they did to the other nations is just awful, including Israel. And uh, shockingly, in this story, this terrible king and his terrible people, this city of scoundrels, as scoundrel as you can get, repents. It says, turns from their wicked ways. It's like, are you kidding me? Now this is like a, this is a really interesting story. So Jonah goes up on the hill to wait on the mountainside or the hill beside the city to wait for God's destruction. And so just the imagery that's uh, in the story makes me think that, that Jonah went up there because he was going to enjoy watching these, watching these people die. And so um, anyway, he waits for a while and it's really hot. And so God causes a plant to grow up. I think it's overnight. And so the next day, he's got this, this shade. <clears throat> and then, God strikes the plant, and it dies. And in the heat of the day, and it's really hot there, Jonah's sitting on the mountain, waiting for this destruction to happening, probably grumbling and grouchy because it's not, and he is unbelievably hot. And he's very angry at God because God relented from his judgment because the city repented. And this is what Jonah says in Jonah chapter 4, verse 2. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to. <clears throat> to forestall, that is why, sorry, 
what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. So that's where he was trying to go. I knew, right? This is a prophet. He knew who God was. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. So Jonah admits to God at this point, this is why I ran away in the first place. Because you are gracious and compassionate. (laughs) Isn't that crazy? But let's get into Jonah's shoes just for a second. Remember I said that these were scoundrels. These were terrible people. If you were Jonah, you had probably witnessed your people Maybe, maybe people he loved. Maybe it was like, maybe family members, maybe friends. Where, where these Assyrians had just done the most horrific things imaginable to. Can you imagine the hatred, the pain that Jonah had, had gone through? So before we get too judgmental in Jonah for not wanting to do what God asked him to do, <laughs> One of the things we need to realize in this story is that we're Jonah. This story is not just about a prophet. This story is about us. It's about something deep within us. It's about humanity. And in comparison, God. Who, in this story, loves the scoundrels, enough to save their city. This God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And so the stark contrast between Jonah and God is what we need to see in ourselves. That we're, we're much more like Jonah than we are like God. And so... If you zoom back to when this was written long, like thousands of years ago, this was a very scandalous idea that God's, God would love people who weren't specifically his people. <clears throat> this is God's response to Jonah. A little bit later, starting verse 9. But God send, said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant, right? Now, let's get this into perspective, God's saying. You're mad because that plant died. (laughs) And I'm, and oh, sorry. It is, he said. I can imagine him saying it. It is. (laughs) And I'm so angry. I wish I was dead. Wow. Jonah is really disturbed. Again, remember. This isn't just a prophet's story. We're supposed to see ourselves in this story. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant. Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for that great city of Nineveh? God's language here is incredible. Should I not have concern for this great city? Remember, Nineveh is like a terrible, wicked place. And God's calling it a great city. In which there are more than 120,000 people who who cannot tell their right hand from their left. And also, (laughs) God just kind of throws this in for fun, I think. And also, many animals. Like, You're more concerned about this plant because it was providing you comfort. Now, if we're seeing ourselves as Jonah in this story, that's ouch. We're more concerned about our own comfort than we are about the people that are down there that we wanted destroyed because because they're bad. They're scoundrels. And God displays his compassion and love for the enemies of his people, which is ultimately God's enemies. It's scandalous. Like, 
That would have been a really hard message back, back in those days. Uh, you know, at, at this point and, and later on during Jesus' time, there was a belief that, you know, when the Messiah came, it would just be for the Jews. When Jesus, when God became a, a man, that it would be for, to save the Jews. There wasn't this concept that God's love was much bigger than that. In fact, that was just a tiny bit of God's love. But God's love was gigantic, way beyond that. Paul even writes it in Colossians. He says, I'm revealing the mystery that is in Christ. And the mystery is that the Gentiles are included in this new people that God has made for himself. And so this this is a scandalous ending. Does God actually care about wicked people who are far from him that, are, that have hurt and done tor- horrible things to his people? Does he actually love them? Does he actually want them to repent? Didn't they do terrible things? That's the power. I know you guys, if you've grown up in church, you've probably heard this story and it's maybe probably a little bit different, right? <laughs> when you hear it as a kid. Um, But this is a very powerful story. It displays a magnificent aspect of God's love that we don't actually like. (laughs) And you're like, yeah, I don't know about that. But you can talk about that in your small group. Um, But we're going to flesh it out a little bit more. So here's where we're going to go with this. Um, There's just a few things that I want to talk about here. Um... Revolving around this idea that God loves the scoundrel. And so we're going we're gonna to dive into a, a, just one passage here in the New Testament. It's, it's Romans chapter 5. When we were utterly helpless. Romans chapter 5 verses 6 to 11 that is. <clears throat> Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now. Most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good, right? But but God's not like that. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. This is part of the scandalous love that God has. And I know that might be a familiar verse for us, but it is very powerful. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship, this is the NLT, uh, this interesting language it's using, uh, instead of uh, reconciliation, it's using the word friendship. Um, For since, so when you reconcile something, uh, you make it right. So that's ultimately what's going on here. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his, what? Enemies. That makes me think of Jonah's story a little bit different. (laughs) Because we're not just Jonah in the story. We're also the Ninevites. What? (laughs) We were his enemies. Well, when we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God or has made the relationship between God and us right. Hmm. So that kind of broadens our view of this story. So we're Jonah in the story where we we like our comfort and certainly not at the expense of things we don't like, especially people (laughs) we don't like. We're also the Ninevites. We're also far from God, or so it would seem. So let's uh, let's dive into this a little bit. God's, and this is kind of the the theme of, of today's talk. If God loves the scoundrel, even the Ninevites, like maybe today's equivalent would be, like as far as evil goes, like like ISIS or the Taliban or like just they're wicked do terrible, vile things. (laughs) 
that God's unstoppable love, if it's truly unstoppable, like it is powerful force. If God's unstoppable love is not lim- or sorry, if God loves the scoundrel like this, then God's unstoppable love can't be limited, right? It's not limited. And that's, that's, that's oop, maybe you can like, oh yeah, okay. But let's dive into that because I think that's actually a hard truth that we need to wrestle with a little bit. See, sometimes we think that scoundrels or bad people are outside of God's love. In fact, we actually like the idea. And I think it's because there's a, uh, part of the image of God that he's placed in us is kind of a, a, an injustice meter. When we see injustice, something inside of us hurts. And some of us more than others, like God has just done that. For some of you, you might have a really strong injustice meter, <laughs> right? And so I, I remember, I, I've seen so many things that have hurt me deep just, and just watching them because of the injustice that's being committed and immediately, I'm like, God, how can you let this happen? Like, this is, what? Like, the injustice is just awful. And there's something in me that goes like, like, they need to come to a, a terrible end. Or that person, or that group of people that did that. Whatever it is. There's something in you that wants, it's not, now it's not, it, it's justice, but it's more vengeful. Because you, you want them, you want bad things to happen to that person. And so there's comfort in thinking that they're outside of God's love. Just like Jonah felt comfort underneath uh, the plant, we can, we can feel comfort. Do you guys know who um, Bob Goff is? You ever heard Bob Goff speak, read any of his books? The guy's hilarious. <laughs> He's awesome. <laughs> he told a story one time at YC Alberta, at, at our youth were at, that just floor. He got me. And it was such a good story. <sighs> I, okay, I got to tell at least the short version of it. <clears throat> so he, t- he told us the story of this witch doctor in Africa. And uh, this witch, witch doctor would steal kids. Lots of times they were orphans sometimes not, depending on the need. And uh, he would take organs from them and then just leave them to die. If they lived, then good for them. If not, meh, he didn't care. And he did this to a lot of kids. And it was all to practice his little magic stuff for adults who would come to him. So it's not just witch doctors. (laughs) It's like, what? Who does that? But part of the healing or whatever he was trying for these people or the sacrifice that they needed to make, they needed human human organs. Like it it was horrific. And he told the story of this one little boy where I forget which body part. I think it was like a kidney or something. And yeah, I think other parts. Like it was just awful. And this little boy, and you're just feeling for this little boy. You're like, no way. Like, this is awful. Like, why are you telling this story? This, this man needs to die. Like, someone needs to go and kill this dude. Like, this is awful. And, uh, and then he starts saying further into the story that um, he ended up adopting this little boy. That had terrible things done to him. And um, he's a lawyer, by the way. And so he worked hard. He, this guy was going to pay. Sure enough, it all worked out. I can't remember all the details of the story, but I know that the guy who got caught went to trial and was thrown in prison. At this point in the story, everyone's going, <laughs> yeah, something's going to happen to this dude, something bad in prison, like that would be good. Right? There's comfort in that. Feeling like, have you ever thought about that? You saw like some terrible murder or something on TV and you just hope that guy gets it in prison or whatever. <laughs> well, as Bob continued the story, um, something changed and I could feel it. I could feel it coming. And I was like, no, no. Sure enough, the witch doctor started asking questions about Jesus. And then 
gave his life to Jesus. Like I sat there, like it was emotional because I had felt the hatred for that guy. I had felt that guy's outside of God's love. He's a scoundrel. He needs to pay. But the problem with that was that I had, I had limited God's love and I felt comfort in this wish doctor dying a horrible death and going to hell. And so these are the two fatal flaws that are in us that we see in Jonah when we view God's love. Number one is some people deserve God's love and some people do not. Now we would, I don't think we'd ever say that statement and yet we feel it. And that's what's going on in our story with Jonah. That's also what was going on in me with the story of the witch doctor. He does not deserve God's love. But as soon as you think someone else does not deserve it, guess what you've done? You've put yourself in the category that you do deserve God's love. And that's, that's dangerous. Because you don't deserve God's love any more than anyone else. Remember our passage? That while we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. So no one deserves God's love. No one can earn it with good behavior or correct or right beliefs. You can't earn God's love. You can't make him love you more by doing good things for him. He already loves you. Like it loves you to the maximum. There's no more. It's in like an infinite love that God has. It's impossible to describe. And so th- this fatal flaw in this, we can start believing that we actually do deserve God's love. And it's not something that's conscious. The danger is that it's subconscious. We're not actually thinking that. But it's, it's actually the, um, it's driving us. It's, it's giving us the perspective that we have. The way we see the world, our worldview is even affected by it. So some people deserve God's love and some do not. That's one of the fatal flaws. And there's more. I just chose two because, yeah, we only have half hour or so here. God's love is limited. So that's the other fatal flaw that we can start thinking. And you start thinking that God's love is for good people. Like, who are good people? Seriously? Again, that puts ourselves in the, oh, well, if if you believe that God loves you, then you must be Good. <laughs> See how dangerous that is? This makes God's love too small. And, and, and remember our passage, why we were still enemies of God, right? We were still his enemies. Ha! Ah, Christ died for us. Wow. God's love is not limited. It's scandalous. And to have that, uh, that witch doctor become a Christian, there's something in us that goes, no, and yet you turn it on yourself and go like, why not? Why does he not deserve it and I do? Why do I get to experience God's love and he doesn't? And so, two things. This is the result. Results of this, uh, this, these fatal flaws in thinking. First one is pride. And then, like, pride, because we somehow, and it's underneath, it's, again, it's not just that you can spout all this stuff off. It's underneath, it's driving us that we're good, that we deserve God's love, and that person or those people don't. Pride. And so what comes out of that is judgment, right? Where it becomes judgmental and callous towards people we consider are scoundrels or outside or too far away from God. Not only that, uncaring, and which is the nicest word I could find. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have been a nice word. We just don't care. We'd rather be comfortable, just like Jonah underneath the plant. We start to think of people too far away from God. They can't be loved by him or saved by him, and they shouldn't is, is what happens. Okay, so that's, that's one of the dangers. That's what we see coming out of Jonah here. Here's the second one. Um, this one isn't coming out of Jonah, but 
this one's, I, I would think, on the flip side of it. Like if you're identifying yourself as not necessarily Jonah, but maybe the Ninevites, that you don't deserve God's love. See, sometimes we think we're too far from God or we're outside of God's love. I mean, I've heard lots of guys I've invited to church would ever talk and they'd, you know, laughingly would say, yeah, I'd get struck by lightning if I walked through those doors. Like, I've heard that actually quite a few times. I'm like, you guys gonna need to, you guys talk to each other about this? <laughs> and it's just this feeling that they're, they're too bad. That they're outside of God's love because of all the bad things. I'm too bad or I'm too broken, right? This is, this is what this reveals. This two fatal, we're gonna have two fatal flaws here too. I'm too bad or too broken for God to love me. I've done too many bad things. And so here's what's behind that. It's, it's, it's a lie. This idea that you can out God's grace and his love? Like, seriously? Is that how small his grace and love is? That you can out him? <laughs> right? His love and grace is beyond measure, like bigger than we can even imagine. And yet somehow we do, we fall into this, we can fall into this, that it's not for me. And sometimes it's our brokenness, or maybe hurt, or someone has hurt us, or said terrible things to us that we've ended up believing. Could be disappointment, disappointment with God, disappointment with the church, other people. Or it could be sin. We just think we're too bad. And so God's love is for other people, not for me. And this one I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, even though I think it's the most significant because we're going to hit this in in another talk. The second one is uh, I'm not worth enough for God to to love me. You might feel dirty. You might feel messed up. You might feel like an outsider. But it's a lie. Again, it's limiting God's love. And God's love is unstoppable. See, we believe that God doesn't see us or notice us. Or if he does, we don't want him to see us and notice us because we feel dirty. And we believe the lie that you're, we're not valuable enough to love. I see this a lot, especially, um, well, I, again, I, I said I'd, uh, we're going to get there in another talk. So. But it's hard. This is, this is where our enemy wants to attack. He wants you to believe that you're not valuable. That you're not worth enough for God to love you. And it is a lie. A terrible lie. But it's the product of limiting God's love. So the other one was on others. But we can also limit it on ourselves. So the result is we reject God's offer of love and grace and try to find it other ways. And this right here is what leads us into trouble. When you try to find it other ways because you were designed by God to need this love. And so if you wonder why people do the things they do or wonder why you do the things you do, we're often trying to fill that void because we don't feel like we're worth it. We're valuable enough for God to really love us and it's God's love that we so desperately need. And so we reject it and we put ourselves through all sorts of things. So, God's love, God's unstoppable love is not limited. I hope that's the statement you can take. It's not limited. It can't be. Then it's stoppable, I guess. So no one can earn God's love or deserve his love, right? We're learning this from both these passages, Jonah and Romans. No one can can earn it. You can't earn love, right? It's impossible. It's a gift or a choice. But you can't earn it. And you can't deserve it somehow. You can't deserve this love of God. And yet... On the flip side, you have to embrace the fact that you are worthy of his love. You are. You are valuable. You are created in the image of God. That's why you're worthy. You bear, you bear the image of God wherever you go. It's so cool. 
No one is too bad to be loved from God. Or loved by God. <laughs> loved from God. And finally, no one is too far from God to be saved by him. The image, the image that I like to give is God's not like a T-Rex where he's vicious and got sharp teeth but his arms are too short. <laughs> right? God's arm is not too short. No one, absolutely no one is too far for God to save him, to save them. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. That's the gist of this whole thing. God loves even the scoundrels. Mm-hmm.